It's going to be a great day. I'm excited about meeting on one of these days, especially that God asked us to get together as men. This is not something we've done normally. We're learning His ways more and more. So, Lord, forgive us for not understanding Your ways. And thank You for teaching us Your ways. So, this is the beauty of our relationship with God. He gives us lots of room to hang ourselves. And to revive ourselves. It's all beautiful. Oh. So once again, Father, we ask you to come and speak to our hearts. Open our minds. Open our ears. And bless our day in Yeshua's name. Amen. The, a quick overview of what I'm going to be doing this morning. Just to, for me, it kind of helps to keep things organized and let you see a little bit in your syllabus. There's this order for the day there. But, um, I'm going to start out talking a little bit of you know, a brief discussion of, of God's calendar so we can kind of understand how he keeps time. And then I'm going to be talking a little bit about where we're at on his calendar just to kind of show us where we're at in his seasons. And uh, then uh, talk a little bit about the second coming and what it's going to look like. And what we're going to present is probably things you've never heard before, very, very different than you've heard in Christian eschatology. Uh, we're going to talk about what is our job in the millennium going to be like. We're going to talk about, um, probably most importantly of all of this, is... Uh, how do we survive? How do we thrive is a better word through, well, I like to, for lack of any other word, to call this coming tribulation time. Uh, how do we thrive? And I think that's exactly what he wants us to do is thrive because it's also going to be a huge, huge harvest, a glorious time, something we've been praying for and looking for forever. And uh, some, uh, something to be extremely excited about for ourselves and our families. So, can we start? Okay. Uh, in your outline, I'm talking about your homeless calendar. And I'm going to contrast this with the Roman calendar that we're using today. In the homeless calendar, there's seven days in a week. And you can go back and read in Genesis, he talks about how he started to put all that together, what he did on day one, day two, day three. And he, almost, he didn't name them. The seventh day he named, we call it uh, Sabbath. It's the only day that's named. Every other one is just a number. While our Roman calendar has a name for every day, and every one of those names is named, days is named after a Greek or Roman god. So Sunday is the sun god day, Monday is the moon god day, and so on. So we're, we're using that terminology. We don't even know it's that kind of terminology, because it's what we've known all of our lives. And the days on the Roman calendar change at midnight. The days on God's calendar change in the evening. Because when he created the day, it started out in the evening, from the dark to the light. Is there a little symbolism in that? I think that's his path, isn't it? From darkness to the light. So it can get confusing when we talk about uh, the days when God's calendar is changing in the evening and the calendar we live with every day, the Roman calendar, changes at midnight. So it can get confusing. And that's okay. We'll, we're smart. We can figure it out. We've got the Holy Spirit to teach us, don't we? So then he also keeps his calendar based on the seven feast days. That's what we typically call them. Scripture calls them. In Hebrew, the Moedim, or in English, the appointed times. The seven times a year that, that Jehovah says, I want to get together with my people. It's, these are his days, his times, he chooses to meet with us. They're not Jewish, they're not uh, the churches. They are his days when he wants to meet with us. So, so they're called uh, holy convocations or appointed times. And they, the, the Passover and 50 days after Passover, we've got Shaviot, or, or uh, 
in Hebrew. What's the English word for Pentecost? Then in the fall, uh, the first, um, first day of the seventh month, we'll have trumpets. Ten days later, we'll have the days of atonement. And five, and five days after atonement, we'll have the, uh, Sukkot, or tabernacles in English. The first three holy days or point in times are we're rehearsing what something has happened in the past. The last three in the fall are yet to happen. So Passover is obviously all about when Yeshua came and died for us. Uh, the church wants to call it Easter, but Easter comes from Estar, a uh, fertility goddess. That's where the bunnies and the eggs come from. and. Uh, on the Hebrew calendar, Passover is the same day every year. Didn't he die on one day? Not various days? So just some little thoughts. Um, then Shaviot, uh, Pentecost, is when we celebrate from, from since Mount Sinai, the giving of his word. And uh, we also celebrate the coming of his Holy Spirit, which has always been there, but how it manifests in us. And trumpets is in the fall, first day of the of seventh month, is uh, his announcement of his coming. The blast of the trumpet, the blast of the shofars is a better way of saying that. Uh, then the Day of Atonement is what that's all about. Let's get ourselves right with God, preparing for his second coming which will be someday, sometime, on Tabernacles, which was the same day as his first coming, September 26, 3 BC. It's amazing how we can date these things now. I'll get into that more in a little bit. In Exodus chapter 1, Jehovah uh, says that this will be your first month of the year. And on the, on the uh, which on, our, on the Roman calendar will be April, usually sometimes March, because it varies a lot on the Roman calendar. On the Hebrew calendar, uh, let me put it this way, on the uh, Jewish calendar, they call it Nisan, but on God's calendar, what I would call the Hebrew calendar, it's just called month one. Okay, these names all come from humans. And the moon, God's calendar is based in the sun and the moon. The moon gives us the months. So the first little tiny sliver of the, of the new moon is always the first day of the month. And it progresses and gets fuller and fuller. The 15th day of the month is the full moon. So if you understand those phases as they change on day, every day, you can tell what day of the month it is. And as you understand the height of the moon in the sky, you can also understand what month of the year it is. As you notice in the summertime, uh, uh, in Alaska, the moon is really low. Wintertime is way up high, just the opposite of the sun. People used to really understand these things in the old days, but we've got GPSs now, so we don't know where to navigate by the stars anymore, do we? So it's new days, new times. So. Uh, and the sun gives us the number of days in the year. So the lunar cycle is 28 days, but on the sun it's 30 to 31 days. So every once in a while in the Hebrew calendar, they'll throw an extra month in there to make up for the differences in that. So, uh, the, the, our calendar, Our calendar, the Roman calendar, Roman is, calendar based totally is based totally in the sun. In the, sun. the Islamic, the Islamic calendar, calendar is based totally, totally in the moon. So you can see so why we've got different got ways of doing things. things. People, used People used to worship the sun, but the well, they still do. They still do. And, and the moon. And the moon. The moon god the moon is, is all his original names. Now, now, he also, he also Divides, divides uh, the years uh, the up into seven. Seven, seven days in a week, there's seven, seven holy days, holy in, a days in a year. There's, there's seven years seven of what he calls the Shemitah cycle. cycle. Seventh year of the Shemitah year. year. Uh, he uh, also he then also takes the seven Shemitah cycles, cycles, and seven of those makes a jubilee. A jubilee year is the 50th year. Every 50th year is a jubilee year. 
So this so is how he is keeps not. time from the beginning to the end. And when we're in the millennium, we won't have a Roman calendar anymore, guys. We're just going to have his calendar. Does that make sense? So why not learn it? And if you want to understand scriptures, you need to know this. Because everything Jesus did, Yeshua did when he was on the earth, was based on this calendar that I've just described to you. So if we don't understand that, and we don't understand the weekly Sabbaths, and we don't understand the annual Sabbath, which every one of these seven holy days is an annual Sabbath, or sometimes called a high Sabbath, we're going to mess up our count, and we're going to have celebrate uh, uh, tomorrow as Easter, or yesterday as Good Friday, when that's not possible, according to his calendar. And because there's two Sabbaths in that week, not one, because people don't understand the annual Sabbath, and they make a big mess of the count on the three days and three nights, okay? Now, the, ca the calendar continues just a little bit further. In uh, Genesis 6-3, uh, it says the days of mankind are 120, okay? There's several meanings to that. Some people teach that we all should live 120 years, if, we, if that's God's wish, but I've never seen that in history. They used to live 1,000 years in, back in Noah's days. And then that changed. And you go through all the kings of Judah. They lived 40 years, 50 years at the very most. Most of them lived. They, they started reigning when they were 8 or 10 or 12. And they died 10 or 15 or 20 years later. Uh, I don't know anybody that lives to be 120 today. It, it was, in context of that time, a 120-year grace period prior to the flood to repent. Now, uh, so if you take 120 times 50 on the Jubilee cycles, you come up with 6,000. Does that number mean anything to you? Does, have we often been taught that the days of man are 6,000 and the millennium? Right? Have you heard that? So I think there's the true meaning. He's given us 120 jubilee cycles to repent and get it right and do it his way as mankind. Just like he did the 120 years for the people prior to the flood. You with me here? That makes sense? Okay. So understanding his calendar allows you to understand when Jesus did things and when things happened in history. Now, uh, if you go back to the lineages in Scripture. So we, we've looked at the Jubilee cycles and we say, well, we're, we're uh, in my math shows me we're in the second or third year of the 121st Jubilee cycle. So we're about 6,002, 6,003 since creation. Then if you go, go through all the lineages, you know, in, math, in Genesis 5, it lists Noah was X number, of, was 600 years old when the flood. It lists the lineages from Adam all the way through. Then Matthew and Luke give another set of lineages. And you can actually go add those things all up. I did. I made a big chart. And I added it up at 6,000. See, I did it in 2018. I added up 6,002 in 2018. So it was a couple years ago. Um, Everybody varies a little bit on these things, a year or two, but not very much. So uh, another way of figuring that we are 6,000 years since Adam, approximately. Then here's another way. You can look back at the, at the captivities in, in, uh, in Scripture. When... Uh, when the northern kingdom went into captivity and the southern kingdom, Judah, went into captivity. The northern kingdom was taken into captivity by the Syrians uh, beginning uh, about 722 B.C. The history books will vary a couple of years on that. But there were several raids, several, several wars during that time. So over a 20-year period, thereabouts, the, the entire northern kingdom was taken to Assyria. Uh, and I'm going to go into that in a little more detail of why. And uh, they were assigned a 390-year punishment as demonstrated by Ezekiel in chapter 4. 
Um, but why has that 390 year period never expired? We know it hasn't expired because the Northern Kingdom has never returned to the land. Is that right? In the, in, in the 587 BC, the Southern Kingdom was taken by the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar. And they were, according to the Ezekiel prophecy, they were to be taken for 70 years because of their sins. Well, they returned. That's all recorded. So that's Judah. The southern kingdom is Judah. That's what we, where the word Jew comes from today. The word Judah equals Jew. Uh, while typically the term <laughs> Israel used to apply to the northern and the southern kingdoms, and there was a war uh, in Solomon's time. They split uh, for the second time. And so Judah is the southern kingdom, Israel is a northern kingdom in, today, in today's language, except the northern kingdom has been mostly forgotten about, so we don't know who they are. Then, um, so if we start this count of... I don't want to derail the conversation for later uh, efforts, but I'm sort of understanding... <laughs> What you use? Go ahead. Check. Let's start over. So I don't want to derail the more meat of what you're getting at, but a lot of people say that the Northern Kingdom hasn't returned. What is it you mean by that? Or they're not going to set up the twelve tribes and have the Levitical sections uniquely separate and doing the same thing that we read in the Old Testament or the Torah. And uh, quite frankly, there's many times that the Son is speaking about things in a not literal sense, and when he speaks about the kingdom returning to him, the northern kingdom, quite frankly, that could be also taken as returning to him in the faith and not simply landmass. I'm going to go into that in a lot of detail after a while. Well, great. I segue for later. Thank you. <laughs> These are good questions, guys, because we've been taught so many different ways, and probably my answer and his answer are both right. Okay? So, so we will be discussing this. I'm just laying some groundwork right now. As long as you're getting other comments, uh, might mention that the Gregorian calendar has only been in use for about 400 years. That's not very many out of the last 6,000. We have yep. had a lot of different ways of looking at calendars, and we think that the Gregorian calendar is the cat's meow, yeah. and it's only been around 400 years. It's like the English language. How long has it been around? About 500 years? So, long, enough long enough to get confusing. So how long has the name Jesus been around? 500 years? Same, same question. That's why we use his Hebrew name, which he was called at that time, Yeshua. And names are supposed to be transliterated, not translated. Transliterated means you change the spelling so it's pronounced the same way in every language. In essence, that's what it means. So we should always call, if your name is Tal, we should always call you Tal in every, any language. If your name is Art, it should be Art in any language. It might be spelled differently to pronounce it in that language than A-R-T in English. So that's the principle of translations and transliterations. So back on the Northern Kingdom, guys. Levit the book of Le Leviticus in chapter 25 and 26 says that when we don't repent for our sins, the penalty is multiplied by seven. That applies to us, too. God's rules are there for all of us, so it makes repentance pretty important. So they were to be punished 390 years for their great sins, and I'm going to go through what those great sins are in a little bit, because we're doing the same thing today. And so 390 times 7 equals 2730. You add that to 720. 710 B.C. time frame, count forward, and you come to today. It's time for this northern kingdom to, to, to return to the land. And I'm going to walk you through lots of verses that teach that after a bit. So, again, my point at this point of our conversations is, where are we at on the calendar? I think we're right there for the second coming. God says after 6,000 years. That's what so many things say in Scripture. Second coming. So, my thoughts. Let's see how this plays out. And then with what's going on today with all of the, the 
new inventions that NASA has come out with on their computer programs, we are able to take any celestial event, any eclipse, any uh, astral eclipses, things with the sun and the moon, constellation movements, and pinpoint them. If you know approximately when something happened, like let's say, let's say the birth of Jesus or the birth of John the Baptist, there were celestial events with that. We can go on that algorithm and that computer program, we can tell you that down to the second that some of those events happened. So we can date these things. That's how the September 26, 3 BC date comes from the birth of Yeshua at Sukkot in the fall. That's, is that fascinating? There's a couple of books I've read recently. I'll show you pictures of them. The Writing of God and the Sun's Design by Miles Jones. Miles Jones is a, is a linguist, but he also uses all the computer dating things to back up what he learns in his archaeological digs. It's, so it's fascinating, folks. So what I've tried to present here is four different ways that we can know about where we're at in history because I believe God wants us to know when he's coming back. Just like he did in the first coming. Don't you remember that Yeshua chided the people for not understanding the 70 weeks of Daniel? Not understanding that who he was. And I think he's going to say the same thing to us for the second coming. So, because he wants us prepared. He wants us ready for his coming. He doesn't want us to be like those uh, bridesmaids that were unprepared. He wants us prepared so we can be his vessels of honor and his bride. Now, part of what we're going to come through here today is the understanding that just because we say a few magic words and accept Jesus as our Savior, Yeshua as our Savior, that does not make you the bride. That makes you saved, maybe. But the bride, according to Revelation 19, purifies herself, makes her holy, self-holy and prepared. There's a different scale there, and I'm going to go into that in more detail after a while. So, uh, we can go in and date when Joseph went into Egypt, 1682 B.C., because, uh, and we can date the Pharaoh that he was under, Amenhat III, because uh, we can go back and find Joseph's writings. He, he recorded things in ancient Hebrew language, as well as the Egyptian hieroglyphs. Both are there in the Egyptian records. And uh, they recorded in Amenhat III's reign 40 different celestial events. You can date those. I find this fascinating to know where we're at. Uh, and all of these things that we're learning support the scriptural record. It's just not interesting historical information that builds my faith. Because everything I've studied in scriptures, I can date it. I find that extreme, extremely uh, exciting. So then we can date the, the Exodus from Egypt at 1447 B.C. And it would have started the, the, uh, the 15th of the first month. Right after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at midnight, they left the land. You can come down to the date that it happened, the, the time, the second that it happened. Is that fascinating? I think so. Now, when you put all that together, I believe it's time for the second coming. I have not made many dates this year, next year, but I don't think it's very far away. So to me, this is an incredibly exciting time. By any of the measurements that I know of to how to figure, I think we're there. And again, he wants us to know, and he wants us to be ready. Now, my next question then is, what will it look like? And we've, we've been taught in, in, in church theology or church eschatology or end-time theologies, whatever you want to call it, uh, that there's going to be this big escape called a rapture, and we're going to be taken up in the clouds, and we're just going to live idyllically forever in these clouds. And maybe there's a gold mansion there. If you, if, maybe there's not. Um, 
so everybody, the, the consequence of that type of theology is that we don't take personal responsibility. We hang out and wait for God to come back. I was taught that I could never be holy as God is holy until I died and went to heaven. Uh, I could never accomplish that in this life, even though it's a present tense command. Uh, I think we see a whole attitude of escapism that comes out of that thought process. And I'm going to go through things here that's going to cause you to, to, to look at some other verses and look at them in a different light. Is that okay? Can we take a different look at this? Um, and part of this process of going through this is to understand that the things that recorded in scriptures almost always has had an application for that day and a future application. You all right with this? So a prophecy for that day was given. And the, for, for the first fulfillment, the second fulfillment is usually a lot bigger in scale. So the first time Yeshua came, he came as a lamb. Second time he comes, he's a, as a lion. Different. In some ways, bigger and grander. Okay. Um, so... Why don't you guys uh, turn to Ezekiel 37. And I want to I go through this to give you a picture of a second exodus. Think back on the, the first exodus that's recorded in the book of Exodus. Or in Hebrew, it's the book of Shemot. Okay? The, the Hebrew word Shemot comes from the word Shem, which is all about names. So in the book of Exodus, in English, Shemot, in Hebrew, it means names. And it's all about Jehovah expressing his name to all of the people of the world. Now the word name also carries a meaning of the person's character. So he's expressing his name, expressing his character to everybody. That was the whole purpose of the, the plagues. Because the plagues were ten different things the people of Egypt worshipped. They were their gods. So through Moses he comes and says to all those people, Hey, my name is, is YHWH, YHVH. I am that I am. I am Jehovah. We could say in English, Jehovah. But in Hebrew and in Greek, there is no J. Just like in Spanish, there's no J. English is probably the only language that has a J sound. So the proper pronunciation would be with an H sound, Jehovah. And you can put all the vowels in there and enunciate it lots of ways. Okay? So the whole purpose of, of Jehovah was to save the world. In the book of Exodus. To expose the false gods and then proclaim himself through Moses and through the many miracles that, that challenged those ten gods that who he really was or who really is. You okay with this? Now, uh, just here we are right in the middle of, of what our uh, Catholic or our Christian people call Easter, and we are calling it Passover. Um, so many people are labeling the days, uh, such as Good Friday, as the day that you know Christ died, and Sunday as Easter, the day that he rose, and we look at it as Wednesday, the actual day that Christ would have had to die, in order for Mary to meet him on Sunday morning walking in the garden because he rose again on Saturday according to the three days and three nights uh, deal. So what I wanted to share was is that many people that I know are still wondering. They say, well, why do we not say stuff about Easter or Good Friday? And I'm looking at them and I'm saying because if you look in what we know now today in the calendars it wasn't those days um, 
then they say to me, but uh, we, we want to give God glory for his death, and that's why we want to focus in on that particular day. So I, my, my point to them was is that, are you really giving God the glory, or are you giving someone else the glory? And so could you share a little bit about how we can minister to those people in that realm? Well, that's a topic for a whole day. Oh, no. <laughs> but my question on all these things, are we going uh, to worship God the way he says in scriptures, or are we going to make up our own rules? And that's going to be, we're going to go through that theme of this many times as we continue through the topics this morning. So I hope all of us here are choosing, I want to worship God the way he tells me to worship, not the way that uh, I've learned it over time, because he tells us in Scripture that most of what we've learned over time is, is the teachings of men, and it's worthless. He, he condemns that all the way through Jeremiah, all the way through many places in the Gospels. So really quick, the way I've addressed that a lot of times is I, I ask a believer to go and search through Scripture and answer a question for me really quickly on how do we love God? According to Scripture, how do we love God? If they're being honest with themselves, the only thing you're going to find in Scripture on how we love God is that we're going to obey Him. Jesus says, if you love right. me, obey if me. If you love me, obey me. It says that from the beginning of Scripture to the end. And then the question then for them is, are you willing to submit? Are you willing to be obedient? And then, I mean, that's, that's the move forward, but it's hard because oftentimes you're going to get people who are just not willing to do that because it's uncomfortable or it steals their favorite time of the year or whatever it is, but that's the real thing, is right off the get-go. Are they willing to do that? Well, even if they are willing to do that, the next discussion happens, what did Jesus teach? See, or what did Yeshua teach? And I use those two words, Jesus and Yeshua, purposely. Because the Jesus in the church taught one thing, the Yeshua, the, the Hebrew Messiah, taught something entirely different. One taught something brand new, changed everything. One taught the Torah. And when you really walk through Matthew, uh, the rules of his kingdom in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, as Pat's doing last night, he's doing all week, we learned Matthew, a lot of things in Matthew 5 that uh, entirely opposite of how they've been taught. So when you go through, through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the scriptures will say, you've heard it said, and then Yeshua says, but or and I say to you, and when you've heard it said has always been a doctrine of the Pharisees, a doctrine of men, traditions of men, and the oral law of the Pharisees. And he, when he says, but I say to you, uh, he's quoting Torah every time. He is correcting what the Pharisees taught. So we have, so, and most people don't understand that. They will look and say, they don't know about the oral law of the Pharisees, the traditions of the elders, as it's called in Scripture. And so they think that's what Jesus was really changing things to, not correct. They'll say the same thing about Paul. But when you're reading Paul, folks, it's critical when Paul talks about the law or when Yeshua talks about the law, ask the question, which law are they talking about? For... Well, Paul talks about four. He talks about the oral law of the Pharisees, which he over and over again condemns, just like Yeshua did. He talks about the Torah, the scriptures, the Old Testament, if you want to use The word Torah simply means God's instructions and teachings. It's a Hebrew word that just means his teachings and instructions. Uh, never, never once did Yeshua or Paul condemn the Torah which is, is the first five books of the Bible, uh, in a larger sense, is just his precepts, his instructions. The word Tanakh is another acronym that applies to the entire, what we want to call today, the Old Testament. It's not old and it's not a testament. Okay? <laughs> Neither one are correct. It's not old and a testament is a legal document. It's a covenant. So neither one of those terminologies used in the church are accurate. And they're not part of Scripture. So if you've got a Bible that has those things, I suggest just tear those pages out. They're added by the men of time, you know. They're not there. So Paul also talked about the law of the civil law and the law of Satan in Romans uh, 7.23. 
So he talked about four laws. But the English gives us one word, law, because the Greek only has one word for law, nomos. So we, it's very confusing. But, but if you, if when you're open to this concept that Paul talked about four and you start studying it, you can pull it out. It's there. And then when you start reading what Yeshua said in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 or any other place, look it up in the Old Testament. Look it up in the Torah, the Tanakh. You'll find what he's talking about. Pat did this several times last night in his sermon. So you guys online need to go look at Pat's sermon last night on our website, akwellspring.com. Go there. And you'll see several times when, uh, when Yeshua was teaching uh, to understand in context what he is saying, find the parallel passage he was teaching from in the Torah or the Tanakh. That's an eye-opening thing to do. Okay? It'll change your theology so quickly. Oh, that's what he was really saying. Okay? I could give you examples, but I don't have time. Okay? Go study it. So, study to show yourself approved workman. Folks, your future depends upon it. Now, so in that first Exodus, in the book of Exodus, book of Shemot, it was all about his name. Moses was there, God's partner. Moses had a rod. He had lots of authority and power, didn't he? Okay. Now, and there was a group of people, uh, 600,000 descendants of Israel in Exodus 12, that came out of Egypt, along with the mixed multitude, which is other people that weren't in the uh, heritage of this guy named Jacob or Israel. They were from other, every other ethnic background. Exodus chapter 12, verse 38, if you want to go read it and study it. So they would have been uh, people from all the different nations. They all put the blood on the doorpost. In other words, they got saved. They went out, did uh, the requirements for Passover, participated in Passover, and they were all called Israelites or native-born people from that day forward. Every, every ethnic group are mixed into what Scripture calls Israel. You can see that same thing in the, the lineage of Caleb that's given in uh, Numbers 32, I think. He was a Kenzanite who crossed over, became a believer, in essence put the blood on the doorpost, and was called, became a member of the tribe of Judah. Same thing is uh, true of Ruth. She was a Moabite. These are examples of what Paul is talking about in Romans uh, 13 about being, or Romans uh, 11 about being grafted in. We're all grafted into God's chosen people, Israel, when we accept a covenant relationship. It's a covenant people, not an ethnic group of people. You all right with this? Go through and study that. Study those lineages. Why are they in the scriptures? Why was Abraham the first Hebrew? The word Hebrew in scripture means to cross over. He crossed over from following the, the pagan gods to following the one true God. See, that's what that's about. He became an, an Israelite or a Hebrew when he did that. Okay? Then, now, let's look at Ezekiel 37. I want to show you a picture here of a second exodus, which you could also call the resurrection. And I'm just going to start reading from verse 1. I'm going to read quite a bit here. Exodus 37, or Shemot in Hebrew, verse 1. And it says, The hand of Adonai was upon me. The Holy Spirit of Adonai carried me out and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. So he, he's talking to Ezekiel here. Or Ezekiel is talking. And he led me all around them. Behold, there was very many on the floor in the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And then Jehovah said to me, Son of man, these bones can live. And I answered, Adonai, Elohim, you know, prophesy over these bones, he said to me, and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord, hear the word of Adonai, hear the word of Jehovah. Thus says Adonai, Elohim, to these bones, behold, I will cause the Holy Spirit to enter you, and you will live. I will attach tendons to you and bring flesh to cover your skin. I'll put breath in you and live, and you will know that I am 
Adonai Yehovah. So I prophesied just as I was commanded, and I prophesied that there was, and there was a noise, and behold, an earthquake, and then bones came together, and bone to its bone, and I saw, and behold, there were tendons to them, and flesh came on, and skin came, and them covered them, but there was no breath. And then he said to me, prophesy to the Holy Spirit, prophesy, son of man, and say to the Holy Spirit, thus saith Adonai Elohim, come from the four winds, Holy Spirit, breathe on these slain that they may live. It's a resurrection, folks. So I prophesied just as he came in. The Holy Spirit came, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, behold, say to these bones, who are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, and we're cut off by ourselves. Haven't we felt like that often? He's encouraging us. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus saith Adonai, Elohim, Behold, I will open your graves. I will bring you up out of your graves. My people, I will bring you back to the land of Israel. We sing a song. Isn't that an incredible song? I will, I will bring you back to the land, folks. It doesn't say on some cloud someplace, does it? And you'll know that I am Adam, I, when I have opened your graves and brought you up out of your graves. Sounds like the first exodus. You will know that I am Jehovah, your God. I will put my Holy Spirit in you, and you will live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you will know that I, Adonai, have spoken, and I have done it. It's a declaration of Adonai. Then he continues in verse 15. The word of Adonai came to me again and said, 16 says, You, son of man, take one stick and write on it, for Judah, the son of Israel, and, and join with him. And take another stick and write out, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel join with him. Folks, this is the northern and southern kingdom it's talking about. And they're still divided. They were divided after Solomon. David put them back before Solomon. David put them back together. They have warred between the, the southern and the northern kingdoms and split up at the Assyrian captivity and are still split up. But he says he's going to put the two sticks back together. He's going to heal them. So I'm showing you a picture of what the second coming is going to look like. Verse 19 says, Thus says Adonai, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, and join them, and I'll put them together with the stick of Judah, and I'll make them one stick. You can go to Isaiah 10 and 11 and read the same story. There'll be one on my hand. And uh, says, I will make you one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. One king. He's that king. Okay? This is the second coming, folks. And they will never again be defiled with their idols and their detestable things or any of their transgressions. I will save them out of their dwellings, which they sinned. Forever, it goes on. So is this a little bit different than the theology we've been taught, maybe? And this gets, this gets better as we go further into this. Now, So both houses, are the northern and southern kingdoms, are done away with. They've made, they're made one in the second coming. They're taken back to the promised land. He, so when he puts this together, it's based in the Torah. It's not man-made. It's based in his word. Uh, there was a, a, uh, an exodus prior, 30 years prior to 1447. It's called in history the Ephraimite exodus. They miscounted the 430 years since Abraham as the time for the Exodus. So at the year 400, they tried their own Exodus. They put together a, a group of two, 300,000 Ephraimite people plus an army of 30,000. You can look this up on the internet. It's common information. And they tried that Exodus. And they got a few miles out of Egypt at the bottom end of the Dead Sea 
uh, Red Sea, uh, Mediterranean Sea, excuse me. They ran out of food. They tried to get some cattle from the locals. The locals didn't want to sell them, so they tried to steal them, and they got destroyed. All but 10 of those people were killed. They went back and told the story. Now, I'm telling you this for a reason. When Israel became a nation in 1948, did God set that up? Or is that no different than this Ephraimite thing? Now, the, nation, the current nation of Israel was established by people, Zionists who wanted a homeland. It's not based in Torah. It's secular. It does not include anybody except Judah. If you can't prove your, your lineage at, through mom as a Jew, you can't not immigrate. So, folks, the, today's nation of Israel is not the Israel that's in Scripture that we've just read about here in Ezekiel 37. Put that down in your notes and think about it. Now, today's nation of Israel, they're calling themselves the vaccinated nation. They're making people wear a little thing. I'm vaccinated to buy and sell or travel. Exactly what Hitler did to them. Just amazing stuff going on, folks. Just think about this. Now, let's turn to Jeremiah 16. I want to read three verses there. Go to start with verse 14. Jeremiah 16, verse 14 says, Therefore the days are quickly coming, declares Adonai, when I will no longer be said, when no longer that Adonai lives, who brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Rather, as Adonai lives, who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and the, all the lands where he had banished them, so I will bring them back into their land that I gave to their fathers. Second Exodus. Resurrection. Behold, I will send many fishers, said Adonai, and, I, and they will fish for them. After that, I will send for many other hunters, and they will hunt for them down from every mountain and every hill, out of every cleft of the rocks, all over the world. Are you getting a picture of what this second Exodus is going to be like? It's going to be a repeat of... The first one, but on steroids at a worldwide scale. I, there's several more verses. In Matthew 4, 19, he sends fishermen out for the house of Israel, which is scattered all over the world. So he sent out hunters and fishermen, and he also sends out his spirit. He whistles. That's sending out his spirit to call his people back to his land. You with me here? You getting a different picture? So in that first Exodus, we have a powerful Moses. The second Exodus, we will have a powerful Moses, even more powerful, because he'll be a worldwide scale. We will have plagues. All about the book of Revelation gives us plague after plague after plague, doesn't it? What's the purpose of those plagues? To challenge the false gods the world's taken on. Just like the first one. But at a grand scale. First Exodus was also about a great harvest. How many people got saved? 600,000 of descendants of Jacob, plus that mixed multitude, which some people say was as many as 2 million men, plus their families. So that's 2.6 million men plus their families got saved back then because the descendants of Jacob or Israel did not know the Lord. They forgot his name even. What do you think? How many people today know the name Jehovah? Even in the church, they use the word Lord or Adonai or God, which are nothing more than titles. Sometimes there's nothing wrong with using a title, but the title is a title. It's not his name. Okay? So, the next Moses will be yelling to the leaders of the world as he did to Pharaoh, let my people go. Going to be a repeat, folks. 
plagues, the famines will be the same as before for the same purpose, to bring his people back to proclaim his name. There's a great harvest. That 600,000 plus the mixed multitude, a couple of million back then, it's going to be billions this next time. Is that exciting? And we're on the cusp of this, folks. This is right next door. This is close. So those that put the blood on the doorpost in the book of Exodus, in other words, they accepted Yeshua as their Passover lamb. We just had Passover. Tomorrow was supposed to be Easter. Scripture talks about vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor in 2 Timothy 2, 19 and 20. It says the vessels of honor are those that have purged themselves of all their iniquities, all their sins. While the vessels of dishonor are still in the master's house, but they haven't walked on into maturity. They haven't purged themselves. They haven't become, made themselves pure bride. They haven't made themselves holy as God is holy, as we're asked to do. Then there's a third vessel in Scripture called the vessels of wrath. Those are the unbelievers. Revelation 12, 17 says that who, those who obey his commandments and accept him as a Passover bland, lamb, as our Messiah, are the bride. It also tells us that it's those that Satan attacks. Revelation uh, 14 and 15 tells us that it's those that keep the commandments and the testimony of Yeshua are protected. He takes them out in chapters 14 and 15 of Revelation and brings them back in Revelation 19 as the bride. Guys, and Zechariah 14 tells us that there's unsaved people in the millennium also. Fascinating concepts. But there's unsaved in the millennium. Those that survived the Arm Battle of Armageddon are alive in the millennium. And they're required to go to Jerusalem three times a year so they, or it won't rain on them. God's teaching them and training them who he is. So, guys, this is time we've wanted for 6,000 years. We've been looking forward to this. It's a time to be, in my view, to be extremely excited. He's out there whistling for us. He's sending hunters and fishers to gather his people. And the, and the, the covenant he gave us on Mount Sinai is a teaching covenant. He wants us all to know it, learn it, and teach it. That's going to continue. Isaiah 5.26 uh, is, is written uh, telling us, That he's whistling for us. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 16 and 17 talks to, is talking to Rachel and reminding Rachel the hope for the future that her children would yet return. So, if this is what the millennium is really like, and we're here, if this is what the second coming is really like, and we're not sitting on a cloud someplace playing a harp, and whiling our, way, day, our days away and doing nothing, do you think maybe if we're here, he's using us like he did Moses? Do you think maybe he has a job for us? Like we're, maybe we're useful? That, remember in Scripture, he only works through people. Is that right? He works through the Moseses. He works through the Abram and Abrahams. He works through us. So, what do you think we will be doing in the millennium? Teaching the Torah, teaching his word, teaching everybody his ways. The unsaved, the vessels of dishonor, everybody. This is God's ways. That makes sense? Remember the Levites in Scripture. They were supposed to be the priests, but uh, not all Levites were priests. And if they were, they only worked five weeks out of the year. 
they had two weeks on their normal rotation and they all had to work at the three times that all men were to go to Jerusalem, Passover and Pentecost and Sukkot. They had duties those times. That's five weeks. What did they do with the rest of their time? They taught the Torah. That's what we're going to be doing. So the unsaved, all of these people in the scripture, so we will be ruling and reigning with Christ. Who do we rule and reign over? And what do we do? We teach. We teach everyone how to become his bride, how to make them ourselves pure and holy. Make sense? Sound like an exciting time? Well, that makes me think I want to be the bride. I'm going to learn how to do it. Make sense? I never thought about having a job in the millennium. Why not? I never really thought about the, the, the resurrection time being a time of a second exodus and being taken back to the land and they had the parting of the Red Sea back then. There's going to be another parting of the sea so everybody can get to the homeland. It's going to be a big repeat, folks. Think about it. Study the scriptures. Study more. You ready for a short break? Let's take 15 minutes. Um, you might want to, you might wonder everything that Art's been talking about. Well, I don't understand why that applies to me or what's the big deal. Uh, my brother has three little boys and uh, he used to live in Wasilla and they go ice fishing. Well, the youngest wanted to go, but he crapped his pants all the time. His mother would change him, they would feed him, they loved him, they accepted him, he was in the family, but he didn't care that he would walk around with the poop in his pants. And my brother said, listen, if you want to go ice fishing, you got to figure this out. Boys who poop their pants don't go to ice fishing. And he was potty trained in two days because he wanted to go. If you want to be a part of what God has for you, you're going to have to deal with your pants. Let's get potty trained, huh? All right, let's take a break. (laughs) 